Sam Jose. We are San Jose. We are San Jose. We are San Jose. We are San Jose. <laughs> Welcome to We Are San Jose. These are your stories. Hello, my name is Brenda McHenry, and I'm going to talk about some community efforts that happened 40 or more years ago in San Jose that have had a very positive effect on the way this city has grown and been governed since then. It was about schools. I'm a transplanted New Englander I came to San Jose in 1967 after seven years in Palo Alto, arriving with three children and a new husband and to a new house. There were lots of new houses in South San Jose, what we call the Blossom Hill area now. San Jose had begun its growth some years before with the arrival of IBM, General Electric, and expansion at Lockheed. I later learned that there had been a good deal of what they call leapfrogging development of housing, skipping over more close-in areas to buy and build in less expensive places. There were big gaps where orchards or fields existed next to new homes. The city council had allowed development without a lot of regard for consequences. I remember the story of one council member who had visited this area and was amazed at all that building. Needless to say, this was before the council was elected by district. One problem with this was the delivery of service to those new homes. Houses need sewers, water, electricity, police and fire services, and schools. We had moved into the Oak Grove Elementary School District. We have a map that shows that, which look, makes it look kind of small in in comparison to uh, the rest of San Jose, but it was, uh, it, it covers a pretty large space and it was pretty empty at the time. But when we got here, my first and second graders were immediately on double sessions. And as I recall, the new Oak Grove High School, which is part of the East Side Union High School District, had opened on double sessions. Here's a definition in case you never heard of this phenomenon. Half of the students, double sessions, half of the students assigned to a school went from early morning to around noon. The other half came in at noon and attended until late afternoon. This was a time when most mothers were stay-at-home housewives, so the problem of child care for working parents was not as huge an issue as it would have been today. Still, it did not give enough time for kids to acquire a decent education, and there was no time for after-school activities. It takes a lot longer to build a school than it does a whole neighborhood of homes. Governments, traditionally school, slow, build schools, and the homes had come first. Oak Grove, at that time, 1968, had six schools, including an intermediate school, Carolyn Davis, for seventh and eighth graders. That was not enough to accommodate all the new families. The state of California controlled the allotment of funds for school construction. The State Board of Allocations made those decisions. Their criteria for authorizing school construction was based on a formula that considered how many students might be expected to live in authorized developments. After meeting with state officials, the district staff and parents learned that a way to speed up building schools was to determine that the need for new schools was already here. That meant taking a survey of the entire district to count house starts, 
call on residents to find out how many infants, toddlers, and preschoolers would be impacting the school system in the next few years. We may even have counted pregnancies, I can't remember. <laughs> we formed the Oak Grove Parents Committee with the stated purpose of increasing state aid for our district. Its objectives were to attempt to relieve double sessions and future overcrowding, to be a test control group for the state, to attempt to change the formula ruling in Title V. That was the regulation which determined how funds would be distributed. To work in conjunction with the school administration, the school board, the school clubs, and state officials, and to join together in a total community effort. There were a dozen or so members of the committee, names I haven't seen in 45 years until I dug up some old letters and documents. Jewel and Pat, who were the co-chairs, Judy, Mary, Jeannie, Judy, Ann, and Cece. Looking back, maybe we should have been the mother's committee, but we had lots of help from dads too. We formed committees, survey taking, survey processing, recruiting, publicity, I was recruiting chair, and I spent a lot of time finding workers from each school area. In addition, I studied the district maps to assign areas and learned the streets in which areas fed into which schools. To this day, I can still, still, still tell you if a, a street is in the Oak Grove School District, except for the new ones. Our survey people spread out through the district and called on homes. They were armed with IBM punch cards and pins to punch them with. The volunteers worked hard visiting homes and counting housing starts, partially built houses in various stages of completion. It occurred to me as I thought about this process that this might not be possible today. Besides the fact that people aren't home in the daytime as much, a stranger at the door asking how many small children live there would not be as welcome a question these days, although I think we had ID badges. The result of all of this was that the State Allocations Board was persuaded to make funds available at a faster rate than it otherwise would have, and this came when only one other area in the state, Orange County, was experiencing rapid growth. In addition, another study was presented to the Bureau of School Planning arguing that the state had to make changes in the laws to facilitate the needs of all school districts in California. Everyone acknowledged that this could not have been accomplished without the involvement of the community. Oak Grove now has 18 schools, including three intermediate and 15 elementary schools. But that wasn't the end. All of San Jose was experiencing this growth, including the Almaden Valley area in the San Jose Unified School District. That response was a, to propose a ballot measure in San Jose to require developers to accommodate the need for schools in their housing plan. Claire Benson and Bobby Fischler, both Almaden residents and members of the League of Women Voters, got Measure B on the ballot in San Jose. An article in the Mercury News in 2013 by Terry Christensen of San Jose State described this effort. It called for a two-year moratorium on new housing, a study of the effects of housing developments, and a supermajority of the council to override school district process protests. Timing was right because new thinking about development issues were taking hold, new council members were elected, and despite well-funded opposition, Measure B passed with 53% of the votes. These folks, many new to the city, were aware that it was their city and their responsibility to create the kind of life they wanted and deserved for themselves and their children. They were, and are, San Jose. Hello, my name's Diane Solomon, and I'm a volunteer at History San Jose, and I've been obsessed with bicycling history here in San Jose, and that's my San Jose story. We've had bicycling here in San Jose for as long as there have been bicycles, from the 1884, when they had the big wheel bicycles that were hard to maneuver. We had a club called the Garden City Cyclers. Um, in 1890, 
pretty much the modern bike was developed and bicycles here democratized transportation. So think about how it was here in the 1890s. There was lots of farmland. People were stuck at farms. If you were wealthy, you had horses and carriages and there were trains and trolleys, but bicycles enabled people to go places. So now farm workers could get off the farm. Women could ride to meetings about um, temperance and get out the vote. So it's 1890 and people loved bicycling. Bicycling was the world's most popular spectator sport from the 1890s almost up until World War II. And here we had all sorts of racetracks where people flocked to because in an era before airplanes and cars, people thrilled at the speed. We had a town of maybe 4,000 people and most people on a Friday night were at a bike track watching the bike riders. I have some notes because I want to make sure to let you folks know that people think of Portland and Davis, California and San Francisco and Boston as big bicycling cities where were their equal. Silicon Valley is known as the home of innovation for personal computers and networking and the internet, but we've also made a lot of innovations here in the San Jose area, started here with bicycling. So let me just go back a little bit. In the 1890s, bicycle racing was huge and we had racetracks here and we had national champions right here in the 1890s and I just want to say their names so they're not forgotten Hardy Downing, Bunt Smith and Otto Ziegler if you go through the pages of the San Jose Daily Mercury and the other newspapers of the era there were lots of articles about bicycling in the 1890s there was a club in 1895 called the Ladies Cycling Club of San Jose there was also an African-American cycling club, the San Jose Cyclers. They were no doubt influenced by a world champion named Major Taylor, the first African-American professional sports star or the most known was not the prize fighter Jack Johnson. It wasn't Jackie Robinson. In 1899, African-American Major Taylor won a world championship in bicycling. He never raced here, but his arch rival Floyd McFarland was a San Jose boy who lived on Delma Street. He got his start delivering newspapers for the San Jose Daily Mercury, and his route was from San Jose to Gilroy every single day. He moved to the East Coast, and he became big, and he promoted races and all sorts of things like that. But it just shows our connection in San Jose to worldwide bicycling and how influential folks were. So in the 1890s, again, to probably World War II, my old friend Terry Shaw says that if you were a man in San Jose and you didn't like bicycling and baseball, there was something wrong with you. So we had championship racers up until the 1990s that routinely went to the national championships and the Olympics. And we had all sorts of racetracks here. We had the Garden City Velodrome that's at Lincoln High School today. They tore it down. Um, that was started in 1936. It was built by Dewey Maxwell with WPA funds. And that tradition continues in racing up until uh, today, we have the Hellyer Park Velodrome. The Hellyer Park Velodrome was there before Hellyer Park, and that was built in 1963 by Ed Stefani, who was a civil engineer for the county. And the purpose of it was to end juvenile delinquency. And for a long time, that was pretty much one of the only bike racing tracks here on the West Coast, and it exists today. So youngsters here can still train to go all the way to the Olympics. Just from here in San Jose, we have that racing tradition. Um, let me go further to talk a little bit about kind of the next era in racing was the 1980s and 90s. Greg LeMond raced here. He was from Nevada, but he was in the, the Northern California, Nevada district. Greg LeMond was the first American to win the Tour de France. He raced here with George Mount and a lot of famous luminaries. So racing has been very big in San Jose on a national level and international level. There's another element of bicycling history in San Jose, and that is one of innovation I was talking about earlier. You might be surprised to know that a lot of the brands you see routinely on bicycles today started out in San Jose. I'll just name them. There was the Blackburn brand, Bontrager, Gyro Helmets, Phil Wood and Company, and specialized brands. Jim Blackburn um, in the, so bikes were pretty much clunkers till the 1960s, or they were expensive racing bikes. In the late 1960s, people like me, the baby boomers, we were in our late teens and early 20s. All of a sudden, 10-speed bikes became affordable, and we, we got them in droves, just droves of them. Hundreds were being sold. Thousands were being sold. Bike shops were doing peak businesses, and there were opportunities for entrepreneurs. Jim uh, Blackburn was a San Jose State um, um, industrial design student and he thought up the idea of bike racks. It may not seem big now, but back in the 
late 1970s, people were riding their bikes across the country. They were riding on camping trips. Like, just like people go to Burning Man, people were getting on their bikes and going places, and he invented the racks that are used today. He sold his brand to Easton Bell, so you can find Blackburn brand things everywhere, but that's how he got started. Jim Gentis was another San Jose State industrial design student, and he was a bike racer, and he helped popularize cyclotrack cycling here. He was a, a, a champion of it. He invented the gyro helmet, which is the first popular modern lightweight helmet. You see those everywhere. That's his brand, and he sold that to Easton Bell. Another uh, fellow from here was Mike Sinyard, Specialized Bikes. He was a San Jose State student who worked his way through selling beater bikes. And when he graduated, he was also part of this big racing scene where there are all sorts of clubs and people rode all over the place. We have San Jose Bike Party today. But back then, there was a whole group of people that enjoyed racing. They uh, started clubs. Um, again, the baby boomers were riding their bikes. General Electric was up and running. A lot of the corporations had bike riders. Uh, Lockheed had a bike club that um, really helped to popularize biking. In the late 60s and 70s, you didn't see many cyclists on the street the way you do today. These are the people that were the role models of the day. So a Friday bike ride by General Electric riders, down, General Electric employees down South First Street became the Island and Cycling Touring Club, which has over a thousand members today and did a lot to popularize bicycling. Anyway, Jim, uh, Mike Sinyard went to Italy. He, um, he, he happened to run into um, a famous bike maker, Cinelli. He came back and he started distributing and selling bicycle things. And that became one of the world's biggest bike makers of today. That's specialized bikes. Now they're in Morgan Hill. So that's another innovation from, from San Jose. And I think that's pretty much my bicycle story. Let me just look at my notes. Um, we have a lot to be proud of here with respect to bicycling history. There have been bicyclists here from the time they were first made. Um, if you, I want one more thing, if you use bike racks, if you use public bike racks, if you use bike lanes, if you put your bike on public transportation like Caltrain, BART, VTA, you can thank the Santa Clara Valley Bicycling Association. There were no rights for bicyclists. Any accommodations you see publicly were done because activists like Ellen Fletcher, Bruce Ball, and members of the Santa Clara Valley Bicycling Association championed that with city officials and government officials. Many members were part of a California committee that innovated the bike lanes and changes to the motor vehicle code that were established nationwide. So we've innovated in terms of clubs and racing and riding and inventing things and also public advocacy. So I want to thank you for listening to my San Jose story. It's Hope you'll visit History Park between now and the end of July. We have an exhibit of bicycling history that's on display every weekend through July 2015. Thank you. My name is Jack LaCurcy. I'm a third generation barber, born in San Jose, California. I have a story right now that I believe is a lost and forgotten story. It's of a man of color who was a very good friend of my family and my dad and, and possibly had his first job in shining shoes for my father in his barber shop. I came to know him when I was about five or six years of age and I would go down to his shoe shine store which was also a residence for him in the back and I would read the f comic papers on the floor as all children do. The thing that interested me about this gentleman was on, on Lincoln's birthday in San Jose, the celebrations were big and they were all in parades. That's where, where, where most people were congregated in San Jose. And every Lincoln's birthday, I would note from my dad's barbershop, was a couple of doors away, that the city would send a big open car to pick him up to honor him in the parade. And he would come out with a suit, completely looking differently. And I was often wondered, well, why such attention for this gentleman who seemed to be a, a normal person to me as a youngster and treated me very well? The story begins in the Delaware area where he was born a slave. And it was during the Civil War that he was shining shoes aboard the ferry boat which crossed the Delaware into Washington or the Potomac as a youngster. And the story is that 
He shined Abraham Lincoln's shoes going across the ferry on the Delaware. He migrated to San Jose many years later and he became a proprietor of a shoe shining shop and uh, they honored him every day because he shined Abraham Lincoln's shoes and of course he went through slavery and wound up in San Jose. His name was Mr. Walker. I remember him very clearly. And um, he lived to a ripe old age. And every Abraham Lincoln day until his deceased, uh, they would send that open car to his business and bring him in the parade. So that, that's a history, a part of the history and events of San Jose and the celebration of the holidays that we had, which we celebrated uh, George Washington's day, Abraham Lincoln's day, the, uh, the, uh, when California entered the Union on September the 9th. We didn't have too many holidays in those days, but we really celebrated them along with church festivities. So this is the history of San Jose, which I would like to have remembered in the books in the incoming centuries. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Paul Normandin. This is my father-in-law, Normandin, and uh, we're here to tell the story of our, our family business uh, here in San Jose. I represent the fifth generation. My dad represents the fourth generation of our family business. And uh, I'll turn it over to him. He can start uh, from when we came into California. Dad? Well, my great-grandfather was an originator, and he was a, uh, actually, he was a uh, iron, uh, iron blacksmith and got into uh, wood carving. So he made violins, he played the music, and they started with buggies, they made the buggies. And uh, we had our own manufacturing company back then, 1875 in January they started. And uh, we've been in San Jose the whole time. So it's been a, a great city, great support of our business over all these years, and uh, so when did, wanna, huh? what did Gramps, when he came down, he, or I should say great-great-grandfather for me, when he came down from Montreal, uh, he hooked up with a gentleman by the name of, was it Hatman? Hatman. And they started, uh, they started together. Um, our, our ancestor was a blacksmith. Hatman was one of the woodworkers, and they started building the custom buggies yeah. uh, for San Jose dignitaries. And... Uh, and then when I think what happened was they, they ended up uh, becoming a franchise buggy dealer. And then in the early 1900s, uh, when automobiles came out, what were some of the first automobiles we sold way the back The first then? one was a Franklin. And uh, then we got into Hudson, Hudson Essex. We got a Chevrolet one time. But we had a lot, numerous cars over the years. And, uh, but our big thing over the years has been our service. That, uh, that's what's kept us alive, the main thing over the years. So uh, San Jose's really supported us very well, and we've tried to give good service to all of our people. So in the 19, let's see, the early 1900s, uh, we were selling buggies, went into the automobile business. In fact, one of the Franklins uh, that we sold in 1915, we actually was able to, we were able to acquire back from the family and uh, it sits on our showroom floor today at the dealership. Um, we, uh, we've been on uh, in various locations where we were, was it San Carlos? What other uh, locations were we in in downtown? Well, San Jose? West Santa Clara Street where the, uh, where the uh, Sharks are now, that was our property originally, it was a building was there. But we actually had three locations in San Jose, Second Street, Santa Clara Street, and my grandfather was helpful in building the De Anza Hotel way back. And uh, so then we, we went out to West Santa Clara Street where the Shark Tank is now. And that, they thought at that time it was way out of the way. And as we know today, it's only a few blocks. So it was interesting the foresight that he had and uh, merchandising techniques. So. Uh, it worked out very well for us. And speaking of the Danzo Hotel, is that the same, about the same time the Better Business Bureau came about? 
Pretty much, yeah. He started the Louis O. My my grandfather. He started the the business bureau. Uh, I can't remember the year, but it was right about that time. Yeah, so he started the Better Business, or one of the guys that started the Better Business Bureau, heavy investor uh, in property uh, about the time of the Great Depression. Oh. Uh, tell us about that one, what happened? They, they, they had a nickname for him as well. Well, my grandfather was uh, very involved in the community, and he owned a lot of stock and everything, but they were, for some reason, he got together and they sold all the stock and they brought all kinds of property. And they got on a ship. What was the name of that thing? Uh, the SS Manolo. And that was right before the, the crash of the stock market. Yeah. And so why they were out floating around the world, the stock market went in the sewer. And uh, my grandfather had a new name. They called him Lucky Louie because he he just was ahead of the market, you know. It was great, so. One of the reasons we were able to survive. <laughs> One oh, of the true. reasons we're still around. Um, and then after that, uh, so he came back. It's, uh, it's come down through the generations. Um, we've been able to, uh, to sustain our, our business uh, based on, on public, uh, on the service that we provide and, and uh, the support of San Jose, like my dad was saying. But, also, we moved out to the location we're at now. Um, that was kind of your doing, wasn't it? That was something that yeah. everyone thought you're a little crazy in the late six, mid to late uh, 60s, that was right? A prickly pear orchard that belonged to the Rabinos. And so we got into that property out there. We, we picked up, I think it's 10, 10 acres. acres. Yeah. And uh, built a dealership. And Carl Chevrolet, he came out at the same time. So we started that, and now it's a it's a major automobile row. So uh, it's interesting. But you know, at the time, it, was it? What was it? I mean, I thought everyone said it was way out in the middle of nowhere. It was. It's going to be hard to sustain a business uh, out in the middle of the orchards where no one lived. Uh, and That's, as we know, San Jose's grown and yeah. uh, it's come to engulf our dealership uh, uh, around the area. So. All it was is apricots and prunes way yep. back. Yep. Valley of Hearts Delight, right? Mm -hmm. so, That's right. So uh, we've had a lot of uh, a lot of uh, blessings and a lot of good luck over the years, and and uh, we can thank San Jose for where we are. Um, and the nice part, we have uh, the next generation coming up. We have uh, the sixth generation is now helping us out at the dealership and and doing real well. So hopefully we'll have another uh, 100, 130 plus years in in the great city of San Jose. And, uh, and that's our story. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next time.